Welcome to the 12.4 recording. So today we're gonna to talk about cross product. So this is another way to multiply uh, two vectors, another uh, concept of multiplying two vectors. So remember what we've done so far, if I have a vector, let's say V and a vector W, and let's say a scalar, which is just a number, C, okay? We first saw scalar multiplication, right? Where, okay, if my vector V is equal to uh, one, two, three, and my C is you know, four, then CV is just, I multiply all my components by that four. Four, eight, 12. Okay. On the other hand, we developed dot product, right? Okay, so if let's say V is the same, one, two, three, and W is equal to one, 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 then V dot W will be equal to what? One times one plus two times one plus three times one. So I multiply the components together and I add them all up and that gives me a number, what? One plus two plus three, six. So those, uh, that's, uh, this is scalar multiplication or scalar product. Not, not scalar multiplication, this is called the scalar product. And then this is the dot product, okay? So those are the ones we've developed so far. And remember uh, when we do scalar product, okay, we multiply a, a number by a vector and we get a vector, okay? Like number dot vector equals vector. In dot product, we do vector times vector and we get a number, okay. Now we're gonna introduce cross product, okay. So in cross product, we're gonna multiply a vector by vector and we're gonna get a vector out, okay. So note, uh, take note of this uh, notation here. For the dot product, we have two vectors and then we have a dot in the middle, right? Dot product. For cross product, we have two vectors and we have you know, an X or a cross in the middle, so cross product. So easy, easy little mnemonic device. Okay, we gotta keep our notation straight. Okay. Now the interesting thing about the, the result of the dot product, okay? When I get this vector out, let, I'm starting with these two vectors V and W, my result, my output, will actually be a vector that is orthogonal or perpendicular, remember those are the same, same thing. Uh, my result is gonna be perpendicular to both V and W, okay? So, uh, a visual example, let me just, whoop. So let's say I have these two vectors V and W, and let's imagine these are in 3D space, okay? So kind of think about these two vectors as coming out of the page a little bit, okay? Uh, their cross product, maybe it's a vector that looks like this, that goes straight up from those, okay? So it is perpendicular to V, and then it is also perpendicular to W, okay? So those, Remember, this denotes a right angle, right? All right, so perpendicular, orthogonal to both of those. Now, let's say, uh, remember that if X is orthogonal to V, we have to have that their dot product is equal to zero, right? Okay. Um, and if, so let's, let's call this our vector X. And if X is also orthogonal to W, then their dot product also has to equal zero. And these requirements are gonna give us a way to determine what X actually looks like, okay? So let's say V is equal to V1, V2, V3, and W is equal to W1, W2, W3, 
and x is equal to x1, x2, x3. Okay. These two requirements are going to allow us to figure out exactly what x looks like. Okay. And this is in the textbook at the very opening of the chapter. It basically comes down to doing a system of equations, and it looks kind of ugly, right? But it, it, it's fairly straightforward. It's just algebra, and it kind of tells us what x, x1, x2, and x3 look like. Okay. So I'm not going to dwell on it. It's not too important uh, how we derive this. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'll give a quick overview. So we're starting, uh, we're starting with this idea. Okay, what is this first equation here? Well, that's just the dot product of V with X. The vec oh, I'm doing it again. V with X. Okay. Um, and that gives us this equation here. And then the second equation is just W with X. And we know that, okay, we want our X to be orthogonal to V and w, so both of these equations should equal zero. And this gives us a system of equations. Okay, so if you kind of go back to your, let's see, we, we solved systems of equations as recently as Calc 2, right, when we were doing uh, partial fractions. So if you think back about um, systems of equations, how would we solve for x1, x2, x3? Basically, I, I would multiply the top equation by w3 and the bottom equation by v3. And then I'm going to subtract the bottom equation from the top equation. And I get this third equation. Okay. That must also be true. <sighs> now, if I set x1 equal to this, plug it in there, and set x2 equal to this and plug it in here. Basically what I'm going to end up with is um, AB minus AB, and that's going to equal zero, right? If I multiply everything out, I'm going to see that this term is going to be the same as this term, uh, except for a negative sign, so that's going to be zero. And again, this is not too, if you want to go through the calculations, that'd be great, but not super important. And then uh, once I have x1 and x2, I can solve for x3, and I see that x3 should equal this. So to recap, uh, if we have vectors v and w, their cross product is uh, the vector x. That vector x, the components of that vector are determined by the components of v and w. So v, remember v is equal to v1, v2, v3. w is equal to w1, w2, w3. The cross product x is going to be the vector with these components. And this looks really ugly, and before you run off and start memorizing this, there's an easier way to find the cross product. You don't have to memorize this. Okay. I, I don't know this. I don't know this at all. I know uh, a general tool to use that is easy to remember and gives us the cross product, as long as you do it correctly. Okay. So don't worry. You don't have to memorize that mess for x. Okay. This is just kind of motivation, and we're going to see that our method gives us the exact same thing that we just saw. Now, to, to, uh, to use this method, we're going to need to introduce a new little tool, okay? And that tool is called the determinant, okay? The determinant is something to do with matrices, okay? So matrices being the plural of matrix. Remember, a matrix is just like a box of numbers, right? Like one, one, two, zero. That's a matrix, right? And those matrices can be as small or as large as we want, okay? And they have this number associated with them. Each, each, uh, each matrix has a, a, some, a number associated with it called the determinant. So how do you calculate the determinant? It's kind of recursive. 
So basically you start with a two by two matrix and then everything just builds from there, okay? So the determinant for a two by two matrix, let's say this is my two by two matrix with uh, entries A, B, C, and D. That determinant is equal to AD minus BC. So basically what I do is I do this times this minus that times that. Okay, so for example, let's say I had the matrix one, uh, three, zero, two. Okay, what's that determinant? Well, it's one times two minus three times zero. Which is two. What about four, six, negative three, two? What's, what's that determinant? Well, the determinant would be eight minus negative 18, 26. So fairly easy. Okay. Now the, the determinant for a three by three matrix builds from there, okay? And I'm gonna put, now I, I, this, this is very deliberate choice of notation. Let's put I, J, and K up in this top row, and then A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. What's the determinant of a three by three matrix? So there's a fun little method What you do is you start in the top left corner, I, okay, with I. And basically what you do is you ignore this column and this row, and then you find, you take I and you multiply it by that determinant, okay? And remember, this is just, now this is just a two by two matrix, right? So we know how to take that determinant. It's BF minus B, C. And then I multiply that by I. I. And then I do some, I start moving across, I move to the right, okay? Now I look at J. Okay. And I eliminate this column in this row. And I make, I, I make a two by two matrix out of everything that's left, right? <laughs> okay, I, I make a matrix out of everything that is remaining. So I have this two by two matrix remaining, A, C, D, F, okay? And I can find that, that, um, that determinant, that's A, F minus D, C. Okay. Now you might think you would add J times uh, the determinant, A, F minus D, C. But actually, you, you want to subtract. Okay, so it's kind of an alternating sign. So we have a positive sign here, a negative sign here, and then we're going to add the next component. Okay, so there's a, maybe you've spotted the pattern. Now we get to K. Okay, so I'm going to put K there. I'm going to eliminate this column and this row, and I'm again left with a two by two matrix. I find that determinant. Okay. That determinant is AE minus BD. So this is my determinant for this three by three matrix, which I have written slightly more neatly here. Okay. So let's try one real quick. So one, two, one, zero, one, four, three, one, six. Let's find this determinant, okay? Now, what would that determinant be? Okay, I'm gonna start with one. I'm gonna eliminate that column, that row, and I have that determinant, right? So I have one times this determinant, which would be six minus four, okay? Now I do minus, right? Minus two, times that determinant, which would be what? Zero minus 12, okay? 
now I'm to here. Okay, I eliminate this column, this row. I take that determinant. So it's one times zero minus three. So that's my determinant, and then I just simplify. So I should end up with 23. Okay. Now, how does this help us? The cross product, we can find the cross product just by doing the determinant of a matrix, of a three by three matrix. So let's say I wanna find, I have these two vectors V and W and I wanna find V cross W, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a three by three matrix. In the top row, I'm gonna put I, J, and K. And I'm putting arrows over them because we're gonna end up using that I, J, K notation that we talked about in a 12, one, 12, two, no, uh, 12, two. So we're gonna end up using that notation. Okay? And then in this next row, I'm gonna put my V, my components of V. So remember V is equal to V1, V2, V3. Okay? So in that second row, I'm gonna put my components of V. And then in my third row, I'm gonna put the components of W. Okay. And then I'm just gonna take this three by three determ this determinant, and that's gonna give me my cross product. So as long as I remember how to do my cross product, it's gonna give me the right answer. Okay. So what is this determinant? Okay. So remember, you would start with I, right? So we're gonna put our I there. And then we eliminate that column, that row, and we take this determinant, which would be V2 times W3 minus V3 times W2. Then we do minus J. We eliminate that column, that row, and we take that determinant. Then we do plus K. Eliminate that row, that column, take that determinant. And that is gonna end up giving us the exact same thing we derived with that system of equations, okay? So this is a you know, nice, simple way to find the, determine, uh, find the cross product. Now I know this feels like a lot, especially if you've never done determinants for, which you probably haven't. This is usually the first time people see determinants. Um, don't worry about it. Once you do this just a couple times, you know, you're gonna start getting the hang of it. It's just a matter of practice. Okay, so the determinant of this matrix here is gonna give us our cross rock. Now I put determinant in DET in quotations because once, once we kind of replace numbers with these I, J, and Ks, well, it's, it's not really a determinant anymore. It's kind of like a symbolic determinant, but it, you know, We'll, we'll be calling it a determinant um, throughout the course. So that determinant is gonna give us our cross product. Okay, so let's do an example before we all get too freaked out about you know, how all this works. Let's find a vector orthogonal to my vectors V equals one, 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 W equals zero, negative three, four. Well, as we've said, if we take the cross product, the cross product is gonna be orthogonal to both of those vectors. So really what I'm asking you to do here, and you know, maybe we could even rephrase it before we get too technical. Let's just say find the cross product of V and W. So let's set up our three by three matrix. I J, K. I got my I, J, and K. What's gonna go in the second row? One, 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 my components of V. Uh, what's going in the third row? Zero, negative three, four. Now let's find our cross product. So I'm gonna start in the top left corner. I got my I, 
and then I'm going to eliminate this column, this row. Now I'm going to take that two by two determinant. So I got I times what? Four plus three, right? Because I'm subtracting negative three. So it ends up being plus three. Now I do minus J. Okay. I eliminate that column, that row. I take that determinant. Okay, that's going to be four minus zero. Now I do plus K. Okay. I eliminate this and this. And now let's just simplify. Now, I've written these vectors in front, but uh, technically they should be in back. So this, the proper way to write this would be like 7i minus 4j uh, minus 3k. And uh, that's our i, j, k notation. Okay, so I, I just put it in front just to keep track of it in my, in my uh, cross, when I was doing my cross product. But at the end, I should write this in proper notation, 7i minus 4j minus 3k. And now if I want, I can translate that into my kind of bracket notation, right? This is the same as the vector 7, negative 4, negative 3. So that's my cross product of these two vectors v and w. Now, this is another example. Let's come back to this example in a moment. Um, let's talk about some of these. Well, actually, let's, let's kind of rehash it now. Um, so remember, this cross product that, uh, it gives me a vector, right? So I'm starting with, for example, two vectors, v and w. And the result is going to be orthogonal or perpendicular to both of those vectors I started with. So that's why this problem we just did, it could have been phrased, you know, originally it was uh, phrased as find a vector orthogonal to blank, uh, to V and W, okay? Because if we take the cross product, the result is gonna be orthogonal to both. Now here's a, a problem, the same exact uh, mechanics um, as the previous problem, but it's just phrased a bit more uh, translately, I guess. Okay, so it says find a vector perpendicular to a plane that passes through uh, the points P, Q, and R. Okay, so first of all, it doesn't give us any vectors. It's, it gives us three points, and it's talking about finding a vector perpendicular to a plane. Okay, what does this all mean? Really, we just have to translate this, and it's gonna, we're gonna see that it's, it's no harder than the previous problem. Okay, so P, Q, and R. Okay. So I'm gonna do just a quick, quick sketch. It's not gonna be you know, to scale or oriented correctly, but essentially what I, what I have, imagine these points are in 3D space. I have P, Q, and R, right? <clears throat> now I can draw a vector from, from Q to P and Q to R. Okay, so the, these two vectors, okay, if I, if I think about kind of uh, all, all the possible, well, I'll, I'll phrase it like this. There is a two-dimensional plane that contains both of these vectors, okay? And if some third vector is perpendicular to both of these vectors, then it's also gonna be perpendicular to that plane. Okay, so this, this um, 
this problem, we could think of this as uh, having kind of two steps. First of all, I'm gonna take these three points and I'm gonna construct two different vectors from these points. So I, I start by making a vector from Q to P and then I make another vector from Q to R. Okay. So this gives me my two vectors. Now I, I need to do some math to find these vectors, right? What, like, what is the vector that connects the points Q and P? This is from 12 to, uh, let's see, I would do X2 minus X1, right? So one minus negative two. Then I would do Y2 minus Y1, so four minus five. I guess this would actually be that vector, Q to P. And then the third component would be six minus one. Okay. So this is the vector that starts at Q and goes to P. Okay, and that simplifies as what? Three, negative one, five. On the other hand, the vector that starts at Q and goes to R and what would that be? That would be one minus negative two again, negative one minus five, and then one minus one, which simplifies as three, negative six, zero. Okay, now, I have two vectors. I need to take their cross. So these two vectors are, you know, these these entries here are these two vectors. Now I just take the cross product and I'm going to get a third vector. Maybe it's going to come up like this or maybe it's going to go down like that. But either way, it's going to be orthogonal to these two vectors. So let's now take the cross product of these two vectors. So how would I do that? I, I make my matrix, I, J, and K. Okay. Second row, three, negative one, five. Third row, three, negative six, zero. So that's my matrix. Now I take my cross product, eliminate, eliminate. Remember negatives, we have minus 15 here, minus J, so that becomes plus 15 J. So I end up with this, which is the same thing as 30, 15, negative 15. Now, this was supposed to be an example from the book, but I ended up using slightly different points at the start. So it's going to be a slightly different answer than uh, what's in the book if you're following along. The, uh, this is correct. It's just different than what's in the book. Um, so this is my uh, vector that is perpendicular to my plane. Okay. So 30, 15, negative 15. Now, let's just talk about the uh, cross product a little bit. Um, as, it, as we kind of con we constructed the cross product this way, okay, if I have two vectors A, B, and I take their cross product and get a third vector C, um, we should expect that A and C are orthogonal, and that's kind of the way we built the cross product. 
if you want to call it that. And we also expect that um, not A and B, but C and B are orthogonal. orthogonal. And this is, let's see, this should be, oop, B, let's see. So uh, remember from section 12.3 when we're talking about dot product, if two vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular, their dot product is zero. So we expect that A dot C is zero and B dot C is also zero. Now, vector uh, C is a vector that is orthogonal to A and B, which we just said, but it's not the only vector orthogonal to A and B. So let's go back here and you know, we're talking about A and B, so let's go ahead and just rename these A and B. Okay. So I take the dot product of A and B and maybe I get this vector here, C. Okay. And C maybe starts here, ends here. Okay. Uh, and maybe if I draw this, it's clear, these kind of 90 degree marks, it's clear that C is orthogonal to A and it's orthogonal to B. But there's a lot of vectors. Any vector along this kind of dotted line will also be orthogonal to A and B, right? So this vector C that we get is not the only vector, okay, that is orthogonal to A and B. It's not unique. So for example, if we came up, you know, maybe this is the vector 0, 0, 2. Well, this vector up here, 0, 0, 4, should also be orthogonal to A and B. Now, if you've maybe been doing a couple of dot products as we go, and maybe you did, uh, maybe you set your matrix up slightly differently, you might have noticed something, okay? Uh, Let's say I take the cross product V cross W and you set your you know, matrix up like this and you do V1, V2, V3, W1, W2, W3. Okay, so that's how I would set it up. Maybe you set your matrix up slightly differently. Maybe you set it up as maybe you had your I, J, K up top, but then you did your W first. you would get a slightly different answer. You know, maybe this answer is uh, two, four, negative one, okay? If you, if you did uh, your matrix, um, if you flipped your V and W, you would get the answer negative two, negative four, positive one. And both answers are correct. Uh, they're just different by a negative sign. So we're gonna explore that idea later, but order, order matters a little bit uh, in that you will get different answers depending on the order you put these vectors in, but both should be correct. We'll discuss that later. Now, um, this is kind of related to the point I just said. Uh, if you do V, uh, if you do V cross W, let's clear this up a bit. So let's say you do V or A cross B in this case. You do A cross B. Uh, maybe your your th third vector C, let's call it, is going to come up this way, or maybe it's going to come down this way. Okay, so we would like to know which one it is, right? You know, uh, and this is this kind of this is kind of where um, the order we do things in comes in. Okay, if I do a one, a two, a three, b one, b two, b three, maybe my vector is going to go up, and then if I interchange these, maybe my vector is going to go down. But if I'm given a and b, if I do a cross b, I'd like to be able to predict. Um, which way my vector is going to go. You know, I'd like to be able to see this. I'd like to be able to look at these two vectors and tell which way my vector A cross B 
is going to point. Where's which which direction is C going to point? And this is where we get to the right hand rule. Remember, we talked about this in section 12.1 a little bit, I believe, but uh, this is where we use it a bit more. So how you're going to do this is um, you're going to imagine putting your fingers, pointing your fingers along A. Okay, so imagine and of your right hand. Okay, so take your right hand and kind of you know, play, you know, play around with this in your mind a little bit. Imagine putting your right hand so your fingers are pointing this way. Okay. Now, maybe your thumb is pointing up like this, or maybe it's, you know, going to be pointing down like that, right? The way you do it is, okay, you, you point your hands in the direction of A, and then you curl them the shortest, along the shortest path to B. So if I wanted to curl my fingers towards B, they would go this way, right? I wouldn't want to curl them all the way around this way. Okay. So if you do that, which direction is your thumb pointing? Well, it would have to be pointing upwards, right? To be able to curl your fingers this way. Okay. On the other hand, if I was doing B cross A, Okay, I would point my fingers in the direction of uh, B. So my fingers would be pointing this way, right? Okay, and then I would curl them through the shortest path towards A. So I need to curl my fingers this way. Now to be able to curl my fingers that way, my right hand would have to be, uh, my thumb would have to be pointing downwards, right? It kind of have to be coming down this way. I'm not doing a very good job of this, but the book, let's see, does the book do a good job of drawing this? Yes, it does. Okay, so check out your ebook page. Uh, well, you should be able to go to the, uh, just click on the section 12.4 in my physical book, it's uh, page 856. So check that out. It's just a little simple tool to be able to tell which direction the uh, vector is going to be pointing. And we will use it in this section. It is a useful tool. Now, I'm going to do things in a little bit different order than the textbook. I think it's going to make our lives a lot easier to go ahead and introduce some properties of the dot product first. And we can use, once we have these properties, uh, some you know, showing or proving some, some, prop, uh, some other results becomes a lot easier. So number one is kind of this idea that we've already been talking about. A cross B um, is the opposite of B cross A. We just multiply it by negative one. So going back up to, well, let's just do another page. So let's say I do, let's say I have two vectors, V and W, and I take their cross product. Okay, and let's say when I set it up this way, okay, so this, this is how I set up V cross W. The V is always in the second row and then the W is below that, okay. So let's say when I set it up like this as V cross W, I get this new vector four, six, negative seven. If I had set it up the other way, W cross V, which would be I, J, K, W1, W2, W3, V1, V2, V3, I should get the vector negative four, negative six, positive seven. So these two are just different by negative sign. Everything's different by, um, everything's the opposite sign. So this is a good way to check your work. If you're ever unsure about an answer, you know, you can do V, v cross W and you should get, you know, maybe you get this. And then if you want to check your work, do W cross V and it should be directly the opposite. Okay. So it, for instance, if you got four, six, 12, and then you did it the other way and you got negative four, negative six, you know, nine, okay, you know, something's going wrong.
So that's property number one. Property number two is, uh, you know, we would call this a linearity type thing, okay? So if A and B are my vectors, so if this is a vector, this is a vector, and then this is just some number, okay? I can just pull my number outside the cross product. Okay. Uh, property three, if I'm adding two vectors together and then I take their cross product, that's the same thing as taking their cross products separately and adding them together. Number four, uh, same thing just from the other side. Number five and six. So one through four, okay, maybe even two through four. Two through four are pretty straightforward and they're kind of what we would expect, right? Maybe number one is weird, okay? You know, if, if we're talking about multiplying numbers, A times B is equal to B times A. It's not equal to negative B times A. But for cross product, this is how it works. And this is even different than dot product, right? A dot B is equal to B dot A. So cross product works a little bit strangely. Okay. And then properties five and six are kind of strange as well in that, okay, if I have B cross C, Okay, that's a that's that gives me a third vector, right? Or well, I guess a fourth vector. It gives me some other vector, and then I can take the dot product of that result with a. Okay. On the other hand, if I had done things in a bit different order, okay, I, I could have done a cross b, and that would have given me some vector, and then taken the dot product with c, and that should give me the same thing as this left side. And now six, and maybe the strangest of all, A cross B cross C, okay, maybe you would hope that you would just be able to rearrange it like this, but you can't. This, is, this would be wrong, okay. We get this kind of strange formula here. A dot C uh, times our vector B. So what is A cross, what is A dot C? That's a dot product, right? So it's just gonna give us a, a number. So I'm multiplying this vector by this number. And then I'm subtracting, let's see, another number times a vector. So the result is a vector, right? So a little bit strange there. Um, Again, this is this would be a good place for you guys to uh, test yourselves a little bit and try and kind of show all these properties. Um, you definitely need to learn them, memorize them. Uh, so a good way to do that is working, kind of proving these yourself. Again, I would start by saying, okay, pretend A is just A1, A2, a3, B is B1, B2, B3, C is C1, C2, C3, etc. Uh, and then show that the left side is equal to the right side. Compute the left side and the right side separately and show that they're equal. Yeah. I think that'd be a useful exercise for you guys. Okay. So this maybe is even a good time to pause your video and review what we've said so far and you know kind of start familiarizing yourselves with these properties don't you know take too long just uh, try and start getting these properties down a little bit and then we're going to use them uh, I'm going to use them at least in my discussion of the next or the remaining part of this section So let's uh, start with this interesting property that a vector, the cross product of a vector A with itself always gives us the zero vector. And the easiest way to show this is just to compute the cross product. So assume uh, A, the vector A is equal to A1, A2, A3, and compute this pro cross product, I, J, K, make our matrix A1, A2, A3, A1, A2, A3, 
Let me compute this. Now, this is, there's this, it's, it's immediate. You can see it immediately if you've taken linear algebra, which you haven't. Uh, I just say that not to show off, but to say there's a lot of intersection uh, of different branches of math going on here. This, this stuff we're learning with vectors, it's a lot of uh, the branch of math called linear algebra. So if you um, ever come back to these recordings, I guess I'll be leaving them up on YouTube, but if you ever come back to them after you've taken that course, you know, think about that. Um, to those people doing that, okay, well, these rows are, uh, we have, copy of the same row so this uh, the rows are linearly dependent so the matrix has a non-trivial null space anyway uh, just compute this cross product what is it I times a let's see a2 a2 um, a2 times A3 minus A2 times A3. Well, that's going to be zero, right? Okay. Minus J times what? A1, A3 minus A1, A3. Again, that's going to be zero. Plus K times A1, A2 minus A1, A2. That's going to be zero. So we get 0i minus 0j plus 0k, which is 0, 0, 0, 0 vector. Okay. Now we can start using our properties here. Okay. Um, we have a, a slightly stronger statement that okay, if the vectors a and b are parallel, their cross products is going to be the zero vector. Okay, so that this this first statement, a cross a is zero. Okay, well a is parallel to itself, obviously, so the cross product is zero. And then here's a more general statement: if a and b are parallel, um, then their cross product is going to be zero. And in fact, it, it goes both ways. If if a if the cross product of a and b is zero, then that means the vectors are parallel. Okay, so this is one of those if and only if statements we talked about last time. Now, we can use our properties to show this. Okay, if A and B are parallel, we could write, you know, B is some multiple of the vector A. Okay. So for instance, okay, if I have A going this way and B is parallel to it, it doesn't matter if, okay, it doesn't matter if B is, I've got to see with it. Remember my plane. It doesn't matter if my vector B is located here or located over here. It doesn't matter. It's all the same vector B. So really I could think of, you know, I could drag this B over to be right on top of A. Okay. So if A and B are parallel, well, this is my vector A, this is my vector B. Really, the vector B is just a scaled up version of the vector A, right? So if A and B are parallel, I can write this vector B as a, a number times my vector A. So then A cross B is really A cross R times A. And we know from our properties, I can pull this R out and it's just a cross A, and we've just shown that A cross A is the zero vector. So I have some number times the zero vector, which is just the zero vector. All right. Now, another nice little uh, fact that we have that we can show from our properties, the magnitude of A cross B. Okay, and this is gonna be important when we start kind of doing our, our physics applications. Um, a cross B, the magnitude of A cross B. So remember these absolute value bars mean magnitude slash length, okay? So I do A cross B, I get some vector, and then I take its length. Well, that length is gonna be equal to the length of A 
times the length of B times the sine of the angle between A and B. So I have A, I have B, I have this angle between them, theta, okay? And then I have this vector A cross B. I can consider the length of A cross B. That length is gonna give, be given by this. Now, it maybe it is a fun exercise to try and prove this. Um, I'll give you a hint. And let's, let me see if the book did it. I don't think the book did it. Not the way I want to do it anyway. Uh, not the first step. Okay, so the kind of second step is very similar. But if you want to try this on your own, think about this, okay? Instead, all right, try and show that A cross B squared, that magnitude squared equals Let's see, I might have to revise this, but I think that's where we're gonna start. We're gonna try and show this instead. Okay, if this is true, then this is true. As long as our angles between pi and zero, which I believe it makes the same distinction in the book. So you might wanna try that on your own, a little challenge problem. I'm gonna take a crack at it right now. So let's see what happens. A cross B squared, the magnitude of A cross B squared, remember, that's the same thing as A cross B, the dot product of A cross B with itself. And then from our formula or our properties, we know a cross b dot a cross b. Well, let's look at that. Our properties, it's property five. So it'd be a cross b cross a. All right. Uh huh. It'll be a cross b, and then dot. On the other hand, this stuff inside, let's try that, A cross B cross A, that would be, we could use property six to rewrite that, right? That would be Let's see, it looks like it would be A cross, no. A dot A, B minus A dot B A. Let's see if I did that right. So front to back minus front to middle. A 
this should be a dot b a minus a a b. Okay. Nope, I had it right the first time. Okay, so that's what's in the box. And then we're doing dot b, okay? And then remember how dot product works. That would be a dot a, so that's just a number. Then I have a vec b dot itself minus a dot b a dot b, yep. So now what is all this? Well, a dot itself, that's magnitude of a squared, b dot itself, magnitude of b squared. Then I have a dot b squared. Okay. And remember a dot b Remember that is magnitude of a magnitude of b cosine theta between a and b or squaring that. So I have a magnitude of a squared magnitude of b squared minus magnitude of a squared magnitude of b squared cosine squared theta. Factor out that magnitude of a squared, magnitude of b squared, I'm left with one minus uh, cosine squared. One minus cosine squared, that's the same thing as sine squared. Now, as long as theta is in between zero and pi, um, when we take the square root of everything, it works out nicely. Okay, so what do I have? I have magnitude of a dot b squared equals magnitude of a squared, magnitude of b squared sine squared theta. I take the square root of everything. I get a cross b equals magnitude of a, magnitude of b sine theta. Okay, a little fun exercise. Um, we can also, when we're talking about the, the magnitude of a cross b, we can also make the nice little uh, connection that it is equal to the area of the parallelogram given by A and B. Okay, so if I have vectors, I'm not gonna go over this, it's not too important. If I have vectors A and B, right? So that's A, that's B. I can make a parallelogram out of this, right? I do another copy of A over here, another copy of B over here. That gives me a parallelogram. This area here is equal to A, the magnitude of A cross B. So see example four in uh, this section from the book if you want more details on that. We're gonna close this section with uh, an example from physics, um, torque. So what is torque? Okay, so when I have, when I apply a force, um, to the end of a lever, uh, that creates, well, let's see, a lever. My physics knowledge is lacking. Let's see. Torque is a, a force generated in kind of a perpendicular direction. So let's say I have a wrench, right? And I'm turning a bolt, okay? So I apply a force to the end of the wrench and it goes downward, right? And then I can consider this wrench as a vector as well. You know, if, if 
it makes it easier. We can consider it when I'm going like this. The torque is the force generated like uh, to screw the bolt in. The bolt's gonna be screwed in that way. The bolt's gonna move that way, right? Perpendicular to this uh, wrench and this force. So that torque is uh, the force moving in off in that perpendicular direction. So let's write a quick example. Let's see, there's an example at the end of the section of 12.4. You know, you got, let's see, is there? Yeah, a bolt is signed, blah, 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 blah. So that one's solved out in the book. So you can see that. Let's find another one. Okay, I found a good example from the book. Uh, number problem number 39. Okay, so in this problem, let's see, we have a bicycle pedal. Okay, it's connected to you know, the gear. Okay, and then somebody's pushing down on the pedal with a force of 60 newtons. Okay, and this pedal is. 18 centimeters long and they make it a bit complicated they say okay this angle is 70 degrees and then the this angle between the pedal and the uh, horizontal is 10 degrees and they ask okay what's the magnitude of the torque that uh, this force generates okay. well what's the torque we've just said okay um, it's going to be the force generated in the perpendicular direction so the torque is gonna be the, the cross product of the force and the, you know, I guess you would call this a lever. I don't, I don't know, you guys, you physics kids can um, correct me, okay. But the, the torque is gonna be the mag, the, the torque, the, uh, is gonna be the force generated in this perpendicular direction. Okay, so what is the magnitude of that force? What's the, the size of that force? So let's call this, the, this, this force vector pressing down on the pedal, let's call that F, and let's call this uh, the pedal, the vector P, okay? So the torque, which is usually uh, denoted as a tau, is gonna be F cross P. Okay. And we wanna know the magnitude of that force. Okay. So remember from our formula that the magnitude of a cross product is the magnitude of F times the magnitude of P times the sine of the angle between those two. Okay, what, well, what is that angle? Well, we said we have 10 degrees here, 70 degrees here. So that angle is 80 degrees, right? On the other hand, what's the magnitude of F? Okay, so that's a bit harder to find, okay? We need to find the magnitude of F, magnitude of P. Well, actually, no, you know, I, the way I did it before I unpaused was complicated but they tell us what the magnitude of F is, right? It's just 60, 60 newtons. What's the magnitude of P? What's the length of that pedal? It's 18 centimeters, I don't know if I mentioned that, which is 0.18 meters. Okay. So 60 times 0.18 times sine of 80. And that would be our solution. Okay. Um, I don't personally like the physics examples. So for example, on a, uh, on a test, I would probably not give you a problem like this. You'll probably see enough of it on the homework. The stuff I'm gonna give you is purely mathematical. I feel bad about giving physics problems because I suck at physics and uh, I'm, I'm all math. So I don't want, expect you guys to be great at the physics stuff. Uh, so anything I test you on is gonna be pretty much purely mathematical. All right, that concludes uh, section 12.4, hope you enjoyed.